Father God, we lift up Saeed to you again. We pray that you would, um, you would keep him safe, that you would guard his heart, guard his mind, keep his body safe, keep him safe from those who literally want to kill him. And it's hard for us who know you so well, who love you, to think that people could do that. But at the same time, we know there is evil in the world. We know that um, the prince of darkness wants to take him down. He doesn't want him alive. He doesn't want him spreading the good news. He doesn't want him telling people that hate him, telling those people that Jesus loves them. But we know that you do, and you're reaching people. But we ask that he would be able to come home. We've been praying this a long time. To us, it's a long time. I can't imagine for him how long the time is. But we pray that he could. And we pray for Nagme and the kids in the meantime. Just keep them all in your tender care and strengthen them because they need it. Because this is really, really, really hard. Now, Lord, we're going to look to your word. We're excited. We want to hear from you. So we ask for you to be the real teacher of our study today. And lead us and guide us in it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, continuing our look at this. What we're going to do is we're going to look at this uh, story of when there were 10 lepers when Jesus went into a town, and they all asked him if, uh, for mercy, and he healed all 10, but only one of them came back to thank him, so I call this uh, message, One Out of Ten Lepers Surveyed. So let's pick it up in verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. So we see beginning in verse 11, at the beginning, first three words, now it happened. As I've said before, every time Luke wrote that, it has a twofold meaning. Number one, this is the next thing that happened. And number two, this actually happened. <laughs> it isn't made up. It isn't uh, a fairy tale. This isn't one of Grimm's stories. This actually went down as he went to Jerusalem. This was a perilous time in the life of Jesus Christ. There were many people, many powerful, influential people who wanted him dead. And that attitude even carried on long after Jesus was dead. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, Jason and other believers were captured by Jewish leaders and accused of turning the world upside down. Now, personally, I believe that Jesus and his followers turned the world right side up. But when you're upside down and then it gets turned right side up, you think things are being turned upside down. But Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem, toward those who want to kill him. He's heading in that direction. And Jerusalem was a perfect place to do it, which shows us something about Jesus Christ. He knew about their plans. Knew in advance, way in advance. He went anyway. In fact, he went specifically to die. He went to Jerusalem specifically to die. That was his plan. Didn't catch him off guard. Revelation 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. From a long time before, it was going to happen. We, I mean, he knew it. It's why he came. He came to die, and he came to die for you and for me. And so this was not a surprise. It was going to have to happen. So here he is. He's going to Jerusalem. And as he went, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, this is another interesting thing, because Galilee wasn't considered the best of places by the best of people. <laughs> Many common types lived there. I remember one time when I was in, uh, living down in Southern California, working at a cabinet shop. We were going to go to a Laker game that night. We were in Santa Fe Springs, and, and Lakers played in Inglewood at the time at the Fabulous Forum. <laughs> That's what they called it. And so we decided to drive, and I was, didn't have, we left my truck at the cabinet shop, so we got in the truck, and my friend, we were driving along, and actually it was a small car, and 
he said he knew a shortcut. <laughs> and he took us through some neighborhoods <laughs> that weren't safe in the daytime. And we're looking around like, um, we better keep going. <laughs> Just don't stop. Don't stay stopped any longer than you have to, you know. And there, I think a lot of us know, if not all of us, neighborhoods that aren't the best, places that aren't the best, that other people would consider maybe not the best of neighborhoods. Well, that's what a lot of people thought about Galilee. Um, it was a hotbed of politically, political unrest. It was densely populated. The religious leaders looked down upon them. You know, kind of like a lot of us. <laughs> Maybe not political unrest, but, but I love that Jesus Christ wants to be among them. It's fine. It isn't just, I'll put up with them. No, he liked being there. But Samaria... Now, that's a different story, because Samaria was where the half-Jew, half-Gentiles lived. Almost all Orthodox Jews hated the Samaritans. They would walk many extra miles if they had to, to avoid going through Samaria on their way. If, if like, a straight shot was through Samaria, mm -mm, I'm going around. I'm not even going to touch the ground of this region. But Jesus wasn't afraid to go into their region, and I just... You've got to love the Messiah. I love that. He wasn't afraid to go there either. So, verse 12. That then, as he entered a certain place, there met him ten men who were lepers. Now, we're not told which village. And I guess that isn't important because if we needed to know the name of the village, God would have told us. It would have been written. Luke would have written it down. But he saw ten people that had leprosy. Now, leprosy was also, is also known today as Hansen's disease. That was terribly feared in the time of Jesus. Um, and I covered this at great length about a year ago in the message on Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. And I put that scripture reference in your notes only if you wanted to, if you don't have a copy of that CD, if you wanted to get one and listen, because I'm not going to go through that whole thing again um, for lack of time. But I will give you a little bit of information on that as we go. But So the lepers stood afar off. Now, Numbers chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, we're told that lepers were required to remain outside the city, and they had to keep their heads uncovered. Jewish men kept their heads covered. They had to keep them uncovered, and anytime anyone got near at all, they'd have to yell, unclean! And they're not talking about anyone else. They're talking about themselves. And that way, the people knew, whoa, these have, people have leprosy. Better not get near them. They, didn't, they weren't sure if it was airborne. They weren't sure of anything. They just said, stay away from him and you'll be better off. And this was a requirement from God himself, actually, because in that passage in Numbers, they were to do that, that they might not defile their camps in the midst of which I dwell. In fact, in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3, we read that lepers gathered at the gate of the city, but they weren't allowed in because of their leprosy. We know from verse 16, later in this section, that one of the ten lepers was a Samaritan. Now, normally, Jews and Samaritans, I touched on this earlier, would have absolutely nothing to do with each other at all, <laughs> not at all. But now that they all have leprosy, all ten of these guys, and none of them can be among their own people, they only have each other. And so they banded together because they're better off together than they are separated. So what do they do? Verse 13, they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now it's possible that the lepers knew about what happened in the past and they wanted Jesus to do what Naaman hoped Elisha would do to heal him of his leprosy. Because in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings chapter 5, we're introduced to a man named Naaman, and Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Syria. Naaman was a great warrior, a tremendous leader. He was a man to be feared, but he was also a man to be feared for another reason, because he had leprosy. Now, in one of their raids, as the army, in the army, on one of the army raids, they brought back a young girl from Israel, and she ended up being a servant to Naaman's wife. Now, the servant girl told Naaman, man, if only, if only we lived in Samaria. There's a prophet of God there who could heal Naaman of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king, the wife told Naaman, Naaman told the king. The king uh, 
wrote a letter on his behalf to the king of Israel. And the way the letter was worded when the king of Israel read it, it made him think that the king of Samaria thought, or Syria thought, that he could heal Naaman's leprosy. In other words, this, uh, the king of Syria wrote a letter that made it sound like the king of Israel, you heal him. And he's like, eh, eh, I can't do that. What's he doing this for? Is he trying to start a fight with me? <laughs> because when I fail, what's going to happen? And he started getting really nervous. Now, Elisha, the prophet, he found out about his king because the king tore his clothes. So he found out about that. And he sent word to the king to have Naaman send him. Just send him my way. It'll be all right. So Naaman was soon at Elisha's door. But instead of meeting Naaman himself, Elisha sent a messenger and the messenger told Naaman what to do. And this is what he said. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. As soon as he heard that, Naaman got really angry. But he thought, I mean, he's a commander, right? He thought Elisha would come out to meet him personally. This is what he thought. He says, I thought he would certainly come out to meet me. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy, call in the name of the Lord his God, and heal me. But no. <laughs> then he said, besides, if I'm going to wash myself in a river, I got plenty of rivers back home that are a lot cleaner than this thing. <laughs> There's no way I'm going in this water. <laughs> are you kidding? And he started to storm off, but his servants stopped him. And they convinced him to say, saying this, if Elisha told you to do something really hard, would you do it? Why not try this? This is easy. Just dip yourself in the water. Do what he says seven times. So he did it. And when he came out the seventh time, the Bible says his skin was restored like the flesh of a little child. So maybe the lepers thought something fantastic like that would happen. Maybe Jesus would stand over there and wave his arms. Maybe he'd tell them to go do something. Maybe they thought there'd be a big, showy healing. And you guys thought that the whole wild thing with the televangelists and stuff, the cue the signs and roll the wonders crowd, you know, that that, that started recently. <laughs> it's way back in the Old Testament times, not at all. Now, before we judge Naaman or these lepers... Have we ever expected God to answer a prayer in a big showbiz style way? And we ever pray and just want some kind of a big <laughs> answer? Kind of like that t-shirt I have. It's a BC cartoon where uh, I don't know which character it is, but he's just praying, oh God, if you're up there, give me a sign. And then a marquee from a theater comes down <laughs> and it says, I'm up here. <laughs> it's like, do, do, we, do we look for signs like that? Do we look for answers from God of that type. That's possibly what these lepers were looking for. It certainly was what Naaman was looking for. So before we get to, oh, I can't believe that, oh, we, we can kind of do that too. Now, apparently these guys know about Jesus and his ability to heal because in the community of the sick and the diseased, word of a cure spreads fast. They hear about something, really? I want to go try that. You know, I mean, it makes sense. And Jesus was known for his ability to heal. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 4, verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and, here it is, healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Now, does that mean every person was healed? I don't think it means every person was healed. I think it means every single type of ailment was healed. So there wasn't anything any type of disease people had that Jesus didn't heal. Now, I'm not saying that he was right or wrong in healing this person and not healing that one. How about the lame guy by at the temple when, was it, Peter and John walked by, right? And he says, hey, I don't, he's begging, he was alms for the poor. He goes, hey, I don't have any silver and gold, but what I do have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he did, and he went walking and leaping and praising God, like that song says, so <laughs> exactly. But... The point is this. I bet Jesus walked by that guy many times. He's a professional beggar. That's what he did. It's all he could do, you know. We'd, we'd, today, he'd have a cardboard sign, you know. <laughs> he'd just be holding up that sign. Alms, alms, that way I don't have to say it. But Jesus waited, didn't heal him because he knew he would be healed later and it would increase their faith and other people's faith at a later point. But the point is he healed lame people before. 
So I believe this scripture says that he healed every single type of thing, and that would have included leprosy. So they know that. So these 10 lepers, by rule, are far away from Jesus, but they call out to him with all they have. Jesus, master, especially because he's far away. You have to yell. Why submit this for your approval? When you need Jesus to act on your behalf, never be afraid to do what it takes to get his attention. Maybe you need to turn off the TV. Maybe you need to not be driving in the car. If you're driving, maybe you need to pull over. Maybe you need to ask for a day off to pray. I don't know, but sometimes it takes more. What about those demons? They can only come out except with what? Prayer and fasting. Sometimes there are times we have to do extreme measures. God is testing our sincerity, however it's working out. By that I mean this, take it seriously. Deuteronomy 4.29 says this, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if, here it is, you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Not a half-hearted one. Hebrews 11.6, but without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must first, number one, believe that he is. First of all, you come to God, you have to believe that he's there. And then he is what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So you have to maintain that focus. You have to seek him. You have to come to him. You have to admit that he's there and then continually come to him. So what do they say? Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Now, master, this was used by his disciples all the time, but not because of his teaching ability. They used it because of his authority. And I'm telling you, many times God will use an illness to teach us something. Okay? I remember when I tore up my knee and I was praying and I said, God, I don't know what you're trying to teach me, but I want to learn it because I do not want to have to take this test again. <laughs> you know, I do not want to get your, have to be, you, you use something like this to get my attention on this matter. Let's clear it up right now. And then many times that happens. Sometimes, you know, I mean, you get a cold might be trying to get your attention. But you know what I'm saying, some of the major things. But I'll tell you what, when we need a healing, it isn't so much his teaching ability we're interested in, we're interested in his authority over the ailment, okay? Like he can say, be gone, and it's gone. So we're saying, hey, please, I need your authority. But anyway, these 10 lepers ask Jesus for mercy. Now think about this. They didn't yell that they needed a healing. Jesus, Master, we need a healing. Really, I had no idea why you were dressed like that with your heads uncovered and 50 yards away from me or whatever. I had no clue. And you look the way you do. You know, I mean, I'm not mocking him in any way. What I'm saying is, it's pretty obvious healing is what these guys needed and wanted, and that's what they were calling out for. What they asked for, though, is mercy. They need Jesus to have mercy on them, to show his compassion by healing them. Now, we all need his mercy, don't we? we I'll answer for you. Yes, we do. <laughs> we all realize, if you're a believer especially, that we're sinners. In fact, even non-believers realize they're sinners. They simply bury that knowledge deeper than others. Some may not believe or at the very least accept that there's a God. But we know we have done things that are wrong. We know that somewhere there is a standard for behavior and we have violated that standard. And mercy from God means we will not pay the price for what we've done wrong. It also means have mercy and show mercy and compassion and heal me, but there are other things involved with asking for mercy. But this crying out to Jesus must have worked because in verse 14, so when he saw them, they got his attention. He turned and looked and he saw them and he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And I'm like, what? Where's the healing? What do you mean? Go to the, what's he talking about? Show themselves to the priests. Aren't they still lepers? What could a priest do? What would a priest do? Except maybe say, go away, you're lepers. <laughs> you know, the priest can't heal anybody. Now, the priest had no power to heal them, but he was designated as the one to pronounce them clean. Leviticus 14 Verses 1 through 32 describes a process that they had, that God gave them for being declared cleaned of leprosy. The cleansed leper 
First of all, he had to consider himself cleansed, and he would go to the priest, but he could only get so close, and then the priest would rele- would come outside the town to meet him because they couldn't go in because they're still considered leprous because they weren't uh, pronounced clean. And then he'd meet him there, and there was a long, drawn-out process of cleansing, which I won't get into all of it. You're free to turn there and read it another time. <laughs> but included, part of the thing is to shave off your body hair everywhere, and there are a lot of animal sacrifices, and it was also expensive, the process. But God was faithful. He also included a low-cost option for the poor. So you didn't have to be only wealthy to be considered cleansed by the priest. Now, in Luke 5, 12 through 14, Jesus healed a leper earlier in our study in Luke just by touching him. Then he sent him to the priest to make an offering for his cleansing as Moses commanded him to in the Leviticus section and to be a witness to them of what Jesus had done for him. So there's that whole process, and he told them, so that's what Jesus is telling these guys to do. Go show yourself to the priests, because you're clean, and they're still lepers. Now, if they did this, it would be a great test of their faith, because even though God had told Moses about this process, we have no record of the process actually having been performed. In fact, if they showed up there, the guys would probably have to get the scrolls out and go, (laughs) blow off the dust, because it's like, I don't think we've used these things. Have you ever? done that we don't have a record of it doesn't mean it didn't happen but we don't know now it's a remarkable thing that jesus asks them to go to the priests remarkable as i said because they're still lepers they really had to step out in faith in fact we have to step out in faith in our christianity as well when jesus the paul told us actually but from jesus we are to put on the new man even though we still look and feel like the old man the old person Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So there's that spiritual process we go through that goes from the old man, the old nature to the new man, new nature. And that's what Jesus is telling them to do physically Take that old body that's diseased and go and present it to the priests as healed. Now, how do these guys respond to this? Jesus told them, go show yourself to the priests. And so it was that they went. They went. That's how they responded. They did it. They were still lepers, but Jesus told them to go. They obeyed. They went toward the nearest priest to show themselves to him. Again, this took tremendous faith. It really did. Faith on the part of all ten of them. Because it says all ten left. And the Lord honored that faith. And how did he honor it? They were cleansed. Now, we aren't told how. I mean, it was from Jesus, of course, but we aren't told how. It may have been gradual. Every step they took, you know, they got a little cleaner, a little cleaner, a little cleaner. Or it may have started at the head, worked down to the feet, may have started at the feet, work up to the head. We don't know, but I know one thing. And it may even have been instantaneous. They got a certain distance and they all got cleansed. Or one, two, like ding, 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 all the way down the line. We aren't told. But I, one thing I know for sure, it was a complete healing because cleansed means to cleanse by curing. They were cured. And, it, and cured means it's gone, eradicated. So this way, when they got to the priest, he would see that they were cleansed. It wouldn't take much more than a glance. Whoa, you guys are obviously clean. Now, can you imagine what their reactions would be? I've tried to, to think about it. I sat there for a while, just in my chair, just thinking. They probably didn't go, well, you know, he did say so. so no big deal. <laughs> of course not. I mean, it's, it must have amazed them. They, who knows if they started talking faster, almost running, couldn't wait, were so excited. The most dreaded disease of their time is what they had, and now it's gone. They're cured. Now verse 15, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God. I have to admit, I do love this, because right after he was healed, he returned to the source of his healing. And because he was now healed, 
he could return and go inside the town without fear of retribution from anyone. And not only that, but he was loud about it. <laughs> he praised Jesus for healing him, and he wanted to be sure that Jesus heard him. And he didn't care if other people heard about it. Now, the only sad part, and we'll get to it in a minute, is only one of them came back. Now, verse 16, And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. This is another case in Scripture of Jesus accepting worship. Every time when somebody bows down at the feet of, of an angel or people who are born again, people who are Christians, and they have someone bow down to their feet, they always say, no, 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 get up, get up, don't worship me, worship God. Here, another one at the feet of Jesus, and he just stands there and says, that's how it should be. <laughs> it's true. It's another, to me, a small indicator, if you will. It's not blatant. You could almost miss it if you didn't pay attention of the deity of Jesus. But the other nine went to the priest. The Samaritan went to our high priest the source of it all. J. Vernon McGee says this, and I love this quote. Why do you go to church on Sunday? Do you go there to worship God and thank him for all he has done for you? Part of your worship is to thank him. About the only thing we can give to God is our thanksgiving. How wonderful it is to just thank him. We are to even make our requests to God with thanksgiving. We ought to have a thankful heart toward him. And I think that's something that does get left out at times, being grateful, being thankful. And I think it actually is the focus of this whole story is thankfulness, the thankful heart. It reminds me of Madame Blueberry in the Veggie Tales. A, a thankful heart is a happy heart, you know. It's true. It really is. And then at the end of verse 16... We're given an interesting piece of information, and he was a Samaritan. To me, this is the real indictment. It means that the other nine were Jews, and none of them came back to thank who ultimately is the king of the Jews, one of their own countrymen. The only one to come back and thank Jesus is the only one who would have been hated by the Jews. So verse 17, Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? Well, the answer is pretty clear. Yes, <laughs> of course 10 were. But where are the nine? Where did those guys go? Now, in all fairness, Jesus did say, go, show yourself to the priest. And this guy, in a way, kind of was defying what Jesus said, right? He didn't say, go, show yourself to the priest, and on the way you'll be healed, and so you'll be thankful and grateful, and so come back then and thank me. So they kind of were following orders. I'm convinced that they were headed to the priests. I think they wanted to get back to a normal life as soon as possible, and they, in their society, would have to wait for that kind of cleansing certificate, so to speak, from the priest to get back to life. Um, life as they used to know it. But a return trip to Jesus to thank him is not asking a lot. Besides, they asked a lot of him when they asked him to have mercy on them, and he granted it. It's funny because um, there are times when I've asked God to do things for me. I've asked him even something little like, can I find my lost car keys? One of the ways I think I've shared this with you before is this is my simple prayer. Lord, I don't know where they are. You do. Can you let me in on it? <laughs> it's clear that he knows where they are. and I have no problem going to him to ask him for it. And I haven't had a time yet when he hasn't come through. But I've had a few times when I've forgotten, at least for a while, to say thanks. And it's embarrassing when I remember. And I'm driving down the road and I look at the key chain and I say, you know what, God? I would not be driving down this road. I would not have the keys hanging in the ignition if it weren't for you. First of all, creating me in the whole thing. But just thank you for showing me where they were. He's like, you're okay. You're all right. No problem. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> He'll accept the thanks anytime. I just think it's better for our hearts if we remember to thank him sooner. Um, I heard a guy say, any, any, any day you don't wake up dead, you're doing all right and you can thank him. Uh, I don't know 
in some respects, I think waking up dead wouldn't be so bad. You'd be thanking him in his personal presence. But while we're still here, that's not a bad way to have an attitude of gratitude, as they say, right? Anyway, so verse 18, were, not, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Now, the, the word foreigner in the Greek is alogenes. That's it, alogenes. It's sprung from another tribe, a foreigner, an alien. So it's clearly not someone that they thought, even Jesus himself acknowledged, was not a Jew, not from Israel. Not their, you know, the Jewish, the pure Jews, so to speak. He wasn't being racist, he's being accurate. Now, the, this Greek word was found on a stone from the temple in Jerusalem. A stone from the actual temple that Jesus went into, Herod's temple. But now these stones are knocked down, as Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not one stone will be left upon another. Because they were bragging about how glorious the temple was. Even his disciples were impressed. It was an impressive structure. And you're like, well, you know, it's not going to be much longer. And these will all be knocked down. Because, you know, Rome destroyed the city and they threw the torch in there. It burned and melted the gold. So they had to tip the stones over to harvest all the gold out. But they found the one stone that has this word on it. And it was formerly at the entrance to the area only Jews could go. See, at the temple, there's that court of the Gentiles, and there's an entrance where the Jews could go. They could go through the court of the Gentiles to the Jews. The Jews could go in, but the Gentiles could only go so far. So this stone was carved with a warning to all foreigners that they could go no further. And this is the only time, interestingly enough, in the whole New Testament, whole Bible, basically, unless you have an a Septuagint, which might have it in the Old Testament, translated into Greek. But it's the only time it was used. Jesus used it right here. Anyway, it's possible that the other nine people who until most recently were lepers, all of a sudden shunned their tenth member. There might be another reason. Remember, even though he wasn't a leper anymore, this guy was still a Samaritan. And it may not have taken him very long to say, well, we're, we don't have nothing in common anymore, so you go away and you can't really come with us to the priest because what priest is going to want to examine you you're a Samaritan you're not one of us that's also possible so whatever the case is all of them were healed because Jesus said so but the Samaritan was the only one to come back to Jesus and thank him that's all we know for sure now it's easy to be upset with the nine men who didn't thank Jesus, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, but have we ever had a Jesus answer a prayer, maybe heal us of a sickness, repair a broken relationship, and we forget to thank him? I have had severe headaches before, nothing like the migraines that people have, and I grieve for them, but I've had headaches that you can barely stand up. And I've prayed and asked God to remove them. Maybe get a, finally get to sleep or something. You wake up and it's gone. And you maybe don't think about it. You think, oh, okay, I'm up and done, to done. And then a while later you go, whoa, wait a minute. Lord, I, I had a horrible headache and you took it away. This is so cool. Thank you. You know, because I don't think I was just like, ah, ah. Whoa, that's wild. It's gone. I've never had one like that with a headache, <laughs> you know. So having that attitude of gratitude it's a great way to go. In fact, I have a, a quote from Warren Wiersbe that talks about the other nine Jews who were healed. And he says, before we judge them too harshly, what is our own GQ, which is gratitude quotient? How often do we take our blessings for granted and fail to thank the Lord? Too often we are content to enjoy the gift, but we forget the giver. We are quick to pray, but slow to praise. This should not be the case. We need to develop, as I just said, an attitude of gratitude. And I think that's so important to have that thought all the time that even as we're praying and asking him for something, first of all, be thankful that we can go to God Almighty and ask him personally. Say, hey, God, you're there and you care. And I'm trying to think of another rhyming word. <laughs> I'm not in despair. Anyway, I don't have a reason to. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, we, just the fact that we can go to him. I was mentioning that, I think it was last Thursday at the prayer meeting, that just the fact that we can come to you is so wonderful and so amazing. 
So you can already be thanking him. It's kind of like thanking him in advance. Because he's going to answer the prayer, right? Will he answer it the way you prayed it? Don't know. That's on him. <laughs> that's his thing. But you can always thank him for an answer because the answer is coming. It's one of three, right? Remember? Yes, no, or that four-letter word, wait. I hate waiting. As Inigo Montoya said, I hate waiting. Now, when I read the part in the Warren Wiersbe quote about GQ, what pops into my mind is Gentleman's Quarterly magazine, GQ, right? But the magazine is, that I thought of isn't GQ, Gentleman's Quarterly. It's GQ, Gratitude Quotient. It was a popular magazine in Jesus' day. Now, I have a slide prepared with the cover of the issue published after Jesus healed him. You want to put that up? There it is. Attitude of Gratitude. It has Jesus Christ. He's at it again. There he is, the Samaritan. Exclusive article in here. The interview, the one who came back. But there's an asterisk there. He's a Samaritan. See, there's Jesus. You can tell which one he is. He has the halo around his head there. It's awesome, isn't it? Anyway, so much for that. Go on. <laughs> Did you know that the thanks we give to the Lord are saved in a book in heaven? This is pretty cool. Listen to this in Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. That's a pretty neat reward for doing what is just common courtesy to say thank you. How often do we do things for people, even if it's your job, and people don't say thanks for like, didn't even care, wasn't grateful, I'm not going to do that for that guy again. Aren't you glad God isn't like that? We come to him and say, Lord, I really need to know where my car keys are. Well, the last seven times you haven't said a word when I found them for you. So, no. <laughs> now, there'll be times when we say, Lord, where are my car keys? He says, you know, today I'm just going to have you wait longer. You know, whatever. You know what I mean? I mean, whatever his purposes are, that's what we need to be thankful for and prayer, prayerful toward. But we always have to have that attitude of gratitude. It's common, what we call common courtesy, which I've discovered, by the way, is very rare. It isn't really common courtesy at all. But it is a great reward that God has it written in a book in heaven. So what does he say to this guy in verse 19? He said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. There are two things to note here. Number one, Jesus doesn't tell the Samaritan to go to the priest for inspection. You notice that? He doesn't say, okay, now, I appreciate the thanks. That's the right thing to do. Now, skedaddle, go on, go to the priest and make sure to get straightened out. He doesn't tell him to do that. He just says, you know what? He's inspected him. He knows he's pure. He's clean, right? And he's found him to be whole. So he just, he doesn't even tell him. He has to go to the priest. Besides, we know that there's a whole inner, not interracial, but racial relations thing that would be a problem. And then number two, he commends this foreigner's faith. He commends him so much so that Jesus tells him his faith is what made him well. And that is a very key word, because well can mean to save a suffering one, one suffering from disease, to make well, heal, restore to health. And that's what happened to all ten. But this guy, as we like to say in the infomercials, but wait, there's more. This guy had something else happen, extra. For this Samaritan, there's more. When he said, your faith has made you well, a better translation would be, your faith has saved you. Because Jesus is saying that not only is he healed from leprosy, he's saved from his sins. He got the total package. <laughs> only Jesus can grant this. You can't go to the priest and get saved from your sins because you're asking a sinner to save you from your sins. <clears throat> Strikes both of them out. You still got nada. But the Samaritan was healed physically and spiritually. Total, complete package. And because of that, what was he? Very grateful, very thankful. What did he do? Came back to the source, as we saw in that magazine cover, down on his face, thanking the Lord, thanking Jesus personally. 
So we really need to focus on one thing in closing on this section of scripture that we looked at today, and that is this. Let's remember to thank God. Remember to thank him. And while we're going through our day, remember to thank him. (laughs) And while we're lying down at night, remember to thank him. And when you get up in the morning, remember to thank him. I mean, I have literally tried to turn things around in the way I think. For example, smash your finger working on something. As they say, you haven't really worked on a car unless you've got a few cuts on your knuckles and scrapes and things, you know, bandages. And I've had people say, oh, does that really hurt? Are you okay? And I'm like, oh, praise God, my nervous system is functioning at peak um, efficiency. It's just really working well. Oh, man. It's like in the cartoons, you know, every heartbeat, it just throbs. But that's letting you know your nervous system is working, which, by the way, is one of the problems with leprosy. I just saw some pictures that uh, either Bob took them or someone on the group over in I- India, Bob Caldwell's over there now, of lepers and their fingers are down to stubs, their feet are half gone. And people think when you get leprosy, it kind of you kind of liquefy and things just drop off. That's not the case. You just become so numb, you can't tell that you're being harmed. And you lose them through more accidental loss than anything else. You just don't know. And I never thought so much of, like, if you touch something and it's hot or sharp or whatever, that that's actually not only to keep you from being wounded, but to preserve the fact that you still have fingers. And you will have them if you you react normally. But if you don't have that reaction, that's how that happens. And so I saw that. So we can be thankful in the midst of the pain, because the pain is there to not only keep us from being injured further, but to preserve us physically. Just, Just being thankful. And the fact that the most important thing, thankful that we're saved. I mean, we are saved. Does that ever get to you? Does that ever ring around, run around in your brain? I am saved. I one day will be in his presence. I one day will see what he looks like. <laughs> it's, it's, it's beyond our comprehension, but it's definitely worth it. And it's just something we should do. So let's pray. Father God, thank you. We really do thank you. I say thank you up here a lot. I don't want it to become something that we just say, something that I just say. But I really want you to know that I'm thanking you. I'm thanking you for creation. I'm thanking you for loving me when at times I'm unlovable. And you do. All of us, Lord, are unlovable at times. And certainly before you, we were really unlovable. But you continued to love us. You reached out, as it says in Isaiah, your arm is stretched out still. You still continue to reach out to us until we responded. And after we're saved, we let you down. And you still love us. And your grace is still sufficient. We are so thankful for you and for healings and for restorations of relationships and family and friends. But mostly, we're thankful that you just showed yourself to us. We needed you, and you showed up. And you do that every time. So thanks, God. Thanks for loving us, caring for us, and sending Jesus to die for us. In Jesus' name, amen.